Thank you very much. Well, in uh, Farsi and in Italian, Don means boss. So I just say, yes, sir, move on. So, uh, hey, I, I'm so glad uh, to be here, and uh, it, it, I'm, I'm very honored to be here. Um, I, I will say uh, I have two girls, and actually I have a uh, two-week-old son at home. Uh, yes, so my wife, let me just tell you something, is... Uh, my hero right now. So she is home with the newborn and two girls uh, so that I can be here. Y'all probably now all hate me for being here. So uh, I'm so glad I, I just let that one out. But anyways, um, so I'm a little bit on fumes right now, as you can tell, uh, as you can probably imagine. Uh, so pray for me um, as uh, I, I share. Let me just really quickly, you heard some of my story, but uh, I was born in Houston when I was two. My family moved to Iran, uh, where my family is from. And when I was six, the Islamic Revolution hit that country, fighting broke out, and my father, being a doctor, had the means to get us back to the States, and we moved back in the middle of, uh, when I was in the middle of first grade. Didn't speak English, I spoke, uh, I spoke Farsi, which is the language of Iran, and so God and in his incredible uh, providence and his plan, he provided for me this Christian lady who became my tutor, and my family, my Muslim family was paying her, uh, didn't know she was a Christian, but they were paying her to teach me English every day after school by reading me books. And so in the second grade, she comes up to me and says, Afshin, I've been reading you all these books. Now I want to hand you the most important book you'll ever get in your life. And she handed me a small New Testament. And she said, you're not going to understand this book now, but promise me you'll hold on to it and read it when you're older. And true story, I took it home, grew up in a very Muslim home, being taught the five pillars of faith of Islam and that Jesus was just a prophet and nothing more. In my senior year, I became curious about the person of Christ and the Lord reminded me, uh, brought that New Testament to my heart and mind and I found it in the bottom of my closet after 10 years and I began reading it and ultimately that's how I came to faith in Jesus. And so uh, this topic that we are going to be talking about, loving the the outcast and loving the sojourner specifically is one that is very near and dear to my heart. And my task today is to establish a theological foundation for showing mercy to the vulnerable, to the outcast, to the disenfranchised, the marginalized, the weak, or the least of these. And we'll be focusing our time this afternoon on three groups primarily that the Bible gives much focus to, and that's the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widows. And so why is this an important topic? Why should we show mercy to the vulnerable? Why should we love the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow? And I want to give three reasons right off the bat. And first of all, it's the nature of God himself. So the action word is that we are to know him. It's the nature of God himself. Secondly, it's the natural overflow of the gospel. And so the action word there is remember. Remember what has been done for us. And then therefore, thirdly, uh, loving the outcast, the sojourner, the fatherless, the widow proves that we belong to the kingdom of God. And I would say the word there is love. So know, know who God is, remember, remember the gospel, and then love. It proves that you actually do belong to the God of love. And so I want to go to the book of Deuteronomy, which is where we're going to be spending the remainder of the conference, and I'm not going to fully exposit uh, this text today uh, like I wish I could. I'm going to just highlight it, but uh, Deuteronomy obviously is written at a time when uh, the people of God were about to occupy the promised land. And Moses is encouraging them, reminding them of all that God has done for them. And he has just laid out for them uh, the, the Ten Commandments that God gave them. And then in Deuteronomy 10, if you want to go with me, in verse 12, Moses writes, And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and to keep the commandments and statutes of the Lord, which I am commanding you today for your good. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens, the earth with all that is in it. Yet the Lord set his heart in love on your fathers and chose their offspring after them, you above all peoples as you are this day. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no longer stubborn. 
For the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who is not partial and takes no bribe. He executes justice for the fatherless and the widow, and he loves the sojourner, giving him food and clothing. Love the sojourner, therefore, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God, you shall serve him and hold fast to him, and by his name you shall swear. He is your praise, he is your God, who has done for you these great and terrifying things that your eyes have seen. Your fathers went down to Egypt, 70 persons, and now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars of heaven. This is the word of the Lord. Let me pray for us. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. And God, we pray that your word would guide and instruct us. And as you promise that your word accomplishes the purpose for which it was sent and that your word does not return void to you. We pray that it would accomplish the purpose that you have for us, that it would fall on fertile soil in our hearts and that fruit will come out of this time as you call us to move. We, We seek not to just be hearers of your word, but to be doers of it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So first of all, I want you to see that we are to love the sojourner, we're to love the outcast because it's the nature of God himself. I want you to see once again in verse 14 and 15, I'm going to say three things about God's nature. First of all, that he is independent. In other words, he's self-sufficient. He's not a needy God. Look at what it says in verse 14. Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the heaven of heavens and the earth and all that is in it. All right? And so in verse 17, it goes on to say, in the beginning of verse 17, he is the Lord, uh, your God, he is the God of gods, the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God, who is not partial and takes no bribes. In other words, God is not a, a, one who, who is needy. He doesn't show favoritism. He's not partial. In other words, usually we show favoritism to someone that we esteem uh, higher than others and we're trying to maybe get something from them or, or get their approval. And so we show them favoritism. And he's saying that God doesn't need to do that. God is not needy and he's looking for something from anyone. He does, he's not taking any bribes. He can't be coerced with a bribe as if you could offer him something that he needs in order to get him to act a certain way. So in other words, he doesn't need any of us. Paul writes in Acts 17 that God is not served by human hands as though he needed anything, but he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. So friends, first and foremost, he didn't create us because he was lonely and he needed fellowship. He didn't save us because he was wondering what's going to happen for all of eternity by himself. No, no, no. God was perfectly satisfied within himself, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He had perfect unity, perfect love, perfect fellowship. So why stress this point that God owns everything and he's not looking to get something from anyone? Because it underscores that his saving work is truly an act of grace and mercy, And those are my second points. First first of all, he's not needy. Second of all, he is a God of grace. In other words, he's a God of totally unmerited grace. He gives his love and favor to whomever he chooses. So verse 15, he set his love on his people. It says here, he wasn't prompted by anything that his people did for him. He chose to set his love. In Deuteronomy chapter 7, if you were to turn back there in verse 6 and 8, he he says that you are a people holy to God. You are his treasured possession. And it says it was not because you were more in number that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you are the fewest of all people. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers. And so friends, let me say this is truly what love is. Love has to be freely given without any price tags attached to it. If I love my wife for what she does for me, then I don't really love her. I love what she does for me, right? And so love has to be freely given. And that's why my favorite verse as a former Muslim specifically is Romans 5a, that God demonstrates his love to us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. In other words, before you did anything to prompt him, while you were an enemy still, God loved you to the nth degree. No greater love has a man than to lay his life down for his friends. 
He's gracious, unmerited, and he is merciful. He shows kindness, love, compassion, care. You see this for those who cannot help themselves. The fatherless, the widow, the sojourner, the down and out, the hopeless, the outcast, the helpless. He helps those who can do nothing for themselves. This is who God is, ladies, and this is who he wants, how he wants to be displayed in the world. In Exodus chapter 34, when he passes before Moses, Moses hears God proclaim, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Ephesians 2, when it talks about that we are dead in our sins, goes on to say, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, he made us alive together with Christ, even when we were dead in trespasses. So again, not because of anything we did, but because of who he is, that he is a merciful God, is the only reason we have hope. Now, before we move on to the second point, why put this stress on knowing who God is, knowing that he is not needy, knowing that he's a God of grace, unmerited grace, and knowing that he is a God who has a passion to hear the cry of the needy and respond. Think of even Hagar, by the way, Ishmael, Genesis 21, who were not in the line of the covenant, and God heard their cry and reached out to them in mercy. Why does God put this kind of stress? Because This is how his glory is put on full display for the world to see. He wants to stress these qualities of himself that he gives his love freely, graciously. He's a merciful God because it highlights his glory. He's committed to his glory. His grace and his mercy clearly manifest his glory to the world. He's not going to share his glory with another. Isaiah 42 says that. Ephesians 1 says that we were chosen in him before the foundation of the world to the praise of his glorious grace. Ephesians 2 says we're saved by grace through faith and that not of ourselves. It's a gift of God and not of works lest any man should boast. You see it? So first and foremost, God, remember who he is. He's a merciful God and it displays his glory. I'll never forget being at Oregon State University doing a seminar on Islam and Christianity and a group of Muslims came to the very back and sat in my seminar and they took a bunch of notes and at the end there was a Q&A time and a bunch of those Muslims stood up and asked me questions and one of them stood up and said, wait a minute, Afshin, are you telling me you know you're going to be in heaven for sure? And I'm like, yeah, friend, that's exactly what I'm telling you. I know I'm going to be in heaven. And he was incredulous. He looked at his friends like, oh, did you hear that? And he looked back and he said, that is the cockiest, most arrogant thing you could say. And I said, friend, it's completely arrogant for me to say, I know I'm going to be in heaven based on what I have done. But there is no arrogance at all. In fact, it gives God all the glory to say, I know I'm going to be in heaven based on what Christ has done for me. You see it? And the opposite is true. If you're saying, I'm not sure because I'm not sure I've really been good enough, then you're putting it on you. You're, you're, trying, you're attempting to steal glory from God. So friend, we love the sojourner first and foremost. We love the outcast because this is what God does. This is who he is. He is not needy. He's not trying to get anything from anyone. He's fully satisfied, sufficient in himself. And we are to be fully satisfied, not in ourselves, but in Christ so that we're not needing anything from the world. God is a God of unmerited grace. We should seek to love graciously and not waiting for someone to deserve it first. We are to be a people who seek mercy for the vulnerable. Why? Because it reflects God. And friends, that's what we were made to do. We were made in God's image. Go back to Genesis. We were made in God's image to reflect his glory. And this is why Jesus teaches his disciples, don't love people who only love you. Because that's what the Pharisees do, tax collectors do. But you're to display his glory. You're to go beyond. Love those who don't deserve your love. Love those who persecute you. Be perfect as your, as your heavenly father is perfect. In other words, show the perfect way. That your righteousness should exceed that of the Pharisees. And so, first of all, we are to Love the sojourner because that's who God is. He's a God of mercy. And when we do, we reflect him. But second of all, so that's the no peace. 
Second of all, it's not just rooted in the nature of God, but it's rooted in, in the fact that it's the natural overflow of the gospel. In other words, we are to remember what God has done for us. So look at verse 19 here, what he says to the Israelites in Deuteronomy. Verse 19, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You were enslaved and cut off from the promised land. And the blessing of God is what he means. This implies that God has done something for you. What has he done? Look at verse 21. He is your praise. He is your God who has done for you these great and terrifying things that your eyes have seen. Your fathers went down to Egypt, 70 persons, and now the Lord, your God, has made you as numerous as the stars of heaven. In other words, he's saying, Israelites, look back and remember what he did in bringing you out of slavery and making you as many as the stars in the heaven, as he, as he promised to do. You saw the terrifying things he did, the plagues, the way he separated the sea and, and brought the sea down upon your enemies. You saw him move. And friend, over and over again, Moses in Deuteronomy roots the call to love the outcast, to love the sojourner. He roots it in the foundation of remembering that you were once one and remembering what God has done for you. I'm going to highlight two of them if you want to turn with me. The first one is in Deuteronomy 16, verse 11. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, the Levite who is within you, in other words, the one that doesn't have land, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are among you at the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name dwell there. And then look what he says, you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt and you shall be careful to observe these statutes. In other words, it's rooted in remembering. Deuteronomy 24, you shall not pervert justice uh, Due to the sojourner, verse 17 of Deuteronomy 24, or to the fatherless, or take a widow's garment and a pledge, but you shall remember that you were a slave in Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you. Same thing he says later on, it shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, in other words, uh, the work of your hands that you left behind in the, in the field. When you gather grapes, verse 21, 22, when you gather grapes in your vineyard, you shall not strip it afterward. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. Then what does he say? You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. So I'm belaboring this, but Deuteronomy over and over again says, love the sojourner. Why? Because you once were. Remember, remember, remember. And remember is a key theme throughout the scriptures. In the judges, the people of God would forget what God did for them. And they would stray away and God would send a judge to remind them again of what God had done for them. Over and over again. This is why God has set up two memorial suppers, the Passover meal in the Old Testament, and then, of course, the Lord's Supper, to be a memorial to remind us of what God has done for us. Because when we remember what God has done for us, that will be the fuel, that will be the motivation that drives us to reach out to those who need our mercy, who need mercy in this world. And what are we to remember now I'm to root this in the gospel. So I'm moving from the nature of God to the gospel. Go to the New Testament now in Ephesians 2. Are you still with me? Say yes. Yeah? All right, good. Go to Ephesians 2. One of my favorite passages to lay out the gospel. I'm not going to, again, hit, hit all of it. But the very beginning of Ephesians 2 says, You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of a disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. In other words, remember who you were. You were dead in your sin, friends. And why does Paul highlight that? He doesn't say you were sick. A sick person can go take some medicine or see a doctor, do something for himself. A dead man can do nothing for himself. He needs someone to make him alive, someone from outside his own resources, himself. And so this is what he's trying to highlight, again, the grace of God. Not because of anything you could have ever even done to merit it, all right? You were dead in your sins. He goes on to say, man, you were enslaved to your flesh to carry out the desires of your flesh, the lusts of your heart. I mean, this is who we were. We say, you know, Jesus came to set you free. And some people say, man, I'm free. I, so as if, like, I can go do whatever I want. No. Friend, 
Jesus came to set you free from doing whatever you want. You're enslaved to doing whatever your heart wants, your, your, your flesh lusted after, running after that. But Christ has came to set you free from that, to make you enslaved to him, to hit righteousness, to what really gives you fulfillment in life. And friend, you are by nature children of wrath. In other words, we, not we're, we're wrathful people, we were children destined for wrath. Because God is a holy and just judge, he must punish sin. And so we have the wrath of God bearing upon all of us. This is who we were. So this highlights his mercy. He reaches out to us when we were helpless, hopeless, and we were headed for an eternal doom. We were enemies of God. All right? I'll never forget speaking at a pastor's conference, and I was tasked to speak on, on, on reaching out to others. And I said, man, you will never... A proper understanding of the gospel of grace will move you towards others. And Osama bin Laden had just been assassinated like two days earlier. And I said, friends, and you can hear a pin drop when I said this. If the apostle Paul were with us today, all right, and he heard about Osama bin Laden's assassination, he wouldn't have run to the White House and high five and hoop and holler and celebrate. He would have fallen on his face and said, thank you, God, that when I was an enemy, when I was a terrorist... You know his story, Paul? He was hunting down Christians. Thank you that you showed me mercy. And you came and rescued me. Again, not condoning terrorism, but to say, do you remember that you're an enemy of God? You were. It changes the way you look at God's enemies today with compassion. And then Ephesians goes on, if you jump with me to verse 11, remember, look at this, remember that at one time, and this speaks to the sojourner, you Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, in other words, by the Jews, which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. This is a result of the fall. Adam and Eve sinned, and God drove them out of the garden. And remember there in Genesis, he puts a flaming sword at the edge of the garden, as if to say, for mankind to come back into the presence of God, someone must fall into the sword. There must be a sacrifice for the remission of sin. And so we are separated and then look at verse 13, who falls into the sword? But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. Let me stop there and just say this. That is saying that Christ's death on the cross has brought us near. And when he died on the cross and he said, it is finished, the Bible says that the veil that separated the people of God from the Holy of Holies, the presence of God, was torn in two. You see it? We were separated. We were sojourners. We had no home with God. We were without hope. And God brought us back. And so before I get to my last point, we must remember this. We're, if you, when we forget the gospel, we drift back into entitlement and thinking about ourselves. When we keep our eyes on the gospel, we have fuel to go out to those who are outcasts and who are cut off from God. Let me illustrate it this way really quickly. Uh, I, I don't know how many of you fly Southwest Airlines. Do you fly Southwest Airlines? Anybody? Okay, yeah, thank you. The peanuts flight, all right? And let me, say, let, me, let me tell you where I, why I'm bringing that up. In Philippians 2, let's stay with me. Paul says, I know Philippians 2 has a lot of everything to do with Southwest. Just wait one second. All right. In Philippians 2, um, Paul says this, put others before yourself. Count others more significant than yourselves. Put the interests of others before your own. And he knows you'll never do that. I'll never do that. If I'm just thinking about my, left to my own devices. And so what does he do? He reminds them of the gospel. Remember that Jesus, though he was equal with God, emptied himself and came in the form of a bondservant and became obedient to God all the way to the point of the death of the cross. In other words, put your eyes on the gospel and then you will put others before yourself and you will put the interest of others before your own. You'll go out to the needy. 
All right, so now to Southwest Airlines. Listen to this. I fly it all the time. It's hilarious. Southwest is the only flight, to my knowledge, that doesn't assign you a specific seat. Right? Have you ever flown Southwest? You get a letter and a number. And there's like, you group in 30s. So A1 through 30 goes, then A31 through 60 goes. Then B1 through 30, then B31 through 60, right? And the way you get a A1 through 30 or A1 or 2 or 3, the way you get way up there is you have to do something. You have to pay extra or certainly you have to, you know, get your boarding pass early. Like if you skate into the airport last second and go to the kiosk, you're getting C minus, all right? <laughs> Right? So the A-plus crew, and here's how it works. You get on the plane, and you can pick wherever you want. And you know what never happens? Human nature never does this. Where someone walks out and says, you know what? I'm the first one on the plane. I'm going to go to the very back and sit right in the middle seat, you know, with, you know, the, 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 uh, you know, the bathroom door open, and I hope I smell. You know, no one does that, all right? <laughs> what do we do? We sit at the very front of the plane. We sit in row one, aisle we want to make sure we got stuff, and we want to make sure, I mean, space for our stuff, and we want to make sure we're the first one off. It's all about me. And then you go down about halfway, and then all of a sudden it's too far back, so then the aisles fill up, so then you go to the windows. No one sits in that middle seat, right? That's where you put your stuff, and you hope no one takes it, right? And so by the time C- minus gets on, stay with me here, they're staring at a plane full of available middle seats, all right? And I boarded C- minus once, and there was a father and his son needing two seats next to each other in front of me. And they had the audacity to ask the lady in the first row, hey, do you mind sitting in the second row middle seat and let me sit here with my son? And she goes, oh. I mean, she was appalled. Like, who are you, Mr. C minus, right? To roll up here and get, you know? I mean, it, it, she didn't say all that, but her face said all that, right? And so he was like, never mind. And he moved on and he, you know, asked somebody way down the, down the way. But here's the point. I just, I thought it was fascinating. I go, you know what? She's like, man, I did something for this. And I thought, what if the whole scenario by which she got that seat was different? And I'm not saying this could happen, but what if she missed her flight, her previous flight, and she begged the powers that be at Southwest Airlines to let her on the next flight, and they said, sorry, ma'am, we're a fool. And let's say she kept begging and kept begging, and sorry. And let's say somebody who had a seat, again, I'm not saying you could probably do this, but somebody who had an A1 or 2 seat and didn't need to fly really badly and showed mercy and said, you know what, she can have mine. Now let's say that's how she got on that plane. Now enter father and son. Uh, excuse me, ma'am, do you mind sitting in the second row middle seat so I can sit here with my son? I would be willing to bet that she'd pop out of that chair and say, it's yours. Why? Because, man, I'm on the plane I don't deserve to even be on the plane. You see how when you forget the grace and mercy you've received, entitlement sets in. You think about yourself. But when you remember the mercy that was shown you, you'll put others before yourself. And so friends, we are to love the sojourner, those that are cut off, because it is the nature of God to do so, and we're meant to reflect them because it is an overflow of the gospel. We remember that we once were sojourners. And then finally, I would say this, it proves that we belong to God, the kingdom, the God of love. In verse 19, he roots it in who God is. He is the, the God who loves the sojourner. Verse 19, Love the sojourner, therefore. 1 John 4, beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves is born of God and knows God, and anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And so you prove that you belong if you have a heart for the outcast, the sojourner. I'm tired of some who say, man, why are, you know, Christians sometimes making such a big deal about social issues only, like the racial discrimination that's going around in our country and, and, and maybe how women are, are treated inferior and, and why, why are we making such a big deal about these things? Or how about the refugee, the sojourner? Why do we, they always just, some, some will say, man, why can't we just stick to the gospel? And beware when someone says that. You know what they're doing? They're pitting the gospel against the heart of God, the overflow of the gospel, which is the outcasts. And you can't have the gospel 
and not have a passion to show love and mercy to the outcast, to the marginalized, to the vulnerable, to the disenfranchised, to the sojourner. No, if you have the gospel, you will move towards justice and mercy for those who are in need. It's all throughout. It's laced throughout scripture. Micah 6, he has shown you, oh man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to do justice and to walk and to love mercy, excuse me, and to walk humbly with your God. Isaiah 58, this is the fast that I choose, that you would loose the bonds of wickedness and the straps of the yoke and let the oppressed go free. It is, it, is it not that you would share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? James chapter 1, pure and undefiled religion is this, to visit the orphans and the widows in their affliction, on and on. Uh, Galatians 2, Paul and Peter decide to split. Paul, I'll go to the Jews. Peter, I'll go to the Gentiles. But let's all, let's both do one thing, remember the poor. That's the thing that keeps us common in our mission, the outcast. Matthew 25, Jesus says, here's how you prove you belong to God. That when the Son of Man returns, he's going to separate the sheep and the goats. And you know what he's going to say to the sheep? That when I was a stranger, you welcomed me. You loved me. You clothed me when I was naked. You gave me food when I was hungry. You gave me drink when I was thirsty. When did we do this to you, O Lord? When you did it to the least of these, you did it to me. That's going to prove that you belong. And so, friends, I wonder if we've forgotten this is our mission, that this is the overflow of the gospel. We are meant to display the mercy and the love of God to the world as his, as his ambassadors, as 2 Corinthians 5 says, to reconcile the world to him just as we once were reconciled. And, friends, we live in a very unique time with the refugee crisis and even outside the refugee crisis, just the numbers of people from around the world that are coming to our country. In my hometown, the DFW area, um, 400 people a day immigrate to DFW. 400 a day. And 70% of them are foreign born. Do we see the massive potential that is before us? That Jesus says we are to go and make disciples of all the nations. And in 2018, the nations are moving in across the street. And are we mobilizing to fulfill our calling? Or are we more interested in our comfort and in our safety? You see, friends, there is another remembering. Don't miss this. There is another remembering that we must do. Not just to remember that we once were sojourners, but, friend, to remember that we today are sojourners in this land. Did you know that? First Peter 2, but you are sojourners and exiles. Therefore, keep your conduct honorable among the Gentiles. Right? So that they would see your good deeds and glorify God. Philippians 3 says this, some walk as enemies of the cross with their minds set on earthly things. They're worried about their own earthly things. They're so fixated on America and our safety and comfort. They're not living with an eternal perspective. And he says, but we, our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a savior, Jesus. Friend, if you're a Christian, before you are an American, you are a citizen of the kingdom of God, okay? And you are a sojourner here. So don't think my safety first, my comfort first. And two things happened recently in my life that just kind of blew me away. One was in my home area, there's a little community just northeast of me called Farmersville, and this isn't a blanket statement on everyone in that community. But in Farmersville, they wanted to put a um, Islamic association, the Islamic Association of Collin County wanted to build a cemetery there. And many were up in arms about it. A Muslim cemetery in our backyard? And one pastor stood up and said, friends, we got to put a stop to this. If we let the Muslims build a cemetery in our backyard, more Muslims will come to our community. And I'm thinking, and you're a pastor? A pastor ought to stand up and say, friends, I got great news. The Muslim Association wants to build a cemetery in our backyard, so maybe more Muslims will come into our community, and we can actually fulfill our calling. And so one grieving pastor there 
called for a town hall meeting and invited me to come share my story. And that was a very interesting night. I don't have time to share that. But <laughs> the second is obviously the Syrian refugee crisis that hit. You know, this is obviously two years ago when it really hit full steam. What's happening in Syria, obviously, what's happening with ISIS spreading and many refugees going all over. And so I was actually called to Washington, D.C. to sit on a panel on Capitol Hill and give a Christian response to the refugee crisis. What should we do with the, the refugees that without home, those that are without home, the sojourner? And so I was there with uh, a lady from World Relief, somebody from our State Department, and then Dr. Moore from the Ethics and Religious Liberty Commission of the Southern Baptist Convention. And then Afshin Ziafat, Iranian Christian <laughs> pastor in Frisco, Texas. What am I doing here? Here's what I, I think I was doing there. And this is what I said, and I'll share it with you. And I'm not here to make any kind of political statement, all right? I'm, I, I, about, I'll let the government decide what they're going to do about the refugees coming here and the borders. That's not my point. But I'm just speaking to the heart of a Christian. What, how should we respond if refugees come? I said, I said friends, as, as, a, as an American, yes, I want my government to protect me. Sure I do. I want them to vet who comes in. I want them to make sure that no terrorists get in. Of course I do. I said, but as a Christian, I cannot think protection and safety over all else. And I said, here's what I mean. I said, I've got to think obligation also. I've got to think of how the scripture is so clear that I am to care again for the sojourner, the stranger, the foreigner, especially the orphan and the widow amongst them. Leviticus 19, Zechariah 7, right? But also I am to think opportunity and mission. And so I shared my story. And here's the part of the story I didn't share. When we moved here, now we weren't necessarily refugees, um, but when I left when I was two and I was six and we moved back from Iran, we were escaping the turmoil of Iran, the revolution there, seeking refuge in America. And we came to the States, and I gotta tell you, shortly thereafter, a group of Americans were held hostage in Iran. This is called the Iran hostage crisis. You've probably seen the movie Argo, right? And I'm telling you, it was not easy to be from Iran living in this country. So we had rocks thrown through our window because people knew we were Iranian. We had, my, my, my parents' car's tires would be slashed. They'd wake up in the morning to go to work in their cars. I mean, older high school kids threatened to beat up my brother and I. We were in the second grade. I'll never forget, we were shot at with BB guns coming home. It was a to now listen, I'm not sharing all this to throw a pity party today. But I'm just here to say what I said to them on Capitol Hill. I said this, I'm just thankful that one Christian lady looked at me and looked at my family and didn't see threat but saw opportunity. And she poured herself into me and she taught me English. Had any other American given me that New Testament, I would have thrown it in the trash can. Because I didn't trust many Americans at the time. But I'm thankful that this lady understood her calling as an ambassador to love the sojourner, love the outcast, and she poured herself into me, and she won my ear, the right to be heard by me. And so when she said, Afshin, this is the most important book, I held on to it. And 10 years later, I opened it and became a Christian. You know, Hebrews says, uh, that we are to show hospitality to strangers, for some have entertained angels unawares. Now, that's referring back to Genesis where Abraham all, literally entertained, showed hospitality to an angel of the Lord. And my point isn't that refugees that come are necessarily angels of the Lord, but what the principle I'm trying to draw on is this. Hebrews is saying, you have no idea who it might be that you're showing love to. You have no idea that that Middle Eastern person across the street, that refugee might be another Afshin Ziafat who's going to be a pastor one day. You have no idea. And as Christians, we are not to be constrained by a pursuit of safety and comfort, but a pursuit of our mission to love the sojourner with the intent of reconciling them to the God of mercy. And we cannot applaud missionaries who go overseas 
to places where the gospel is persecuted and Christians are persecuted. We cannot stand in our churches and applaud them for going in harm's way, seeking to spread the mission, to spread the gospel, excuse me. We can't applaud them in our churches and then when the mission field comes to our backyard, we want to board up our windows. Can't have it both ways. And Paul says it this way in Acts chapter 20. He says, I'm constrained by the Spirit. I'm going to Jerusalem, and he says, I know that affliction and imprisonment await me there. And it's almost as if he knows what they're going to be thinking, the Ephesian elders in Acts 20. He knows that they're going to be thinking this, well, then why are you going to Jerusalem? If you know that there's going to be affliction, why not run? He says, I'm going there, and I know affliction awaits me. Then he says this, but... I do not count my life as of any value nor as precious to myself, but only that I finish the course of the ministry that God has given me to preach the gospel. In other words, what is Paul saying? You might think I'm crazy, but friend, hear me. My life, preserving my life is not the aim of my life. The goal of a Christian should not be to extend his or her days by any means possible. But the goal of a Christian should be to spend every day God allots me to have fulfilling this mission. That should be my aim. And so he says, I'm constrained, I'm going. You might think I'm crazy, but there's something more valuable than even my life. And it's the preciousness of this message God has given me. And that should be our aim. And the good Samaritan who saw the one who was beaten when the priest and the Levite passed by, and there's some commentators that say probably because they're afraid that they, that they may have the same outcome if they go to help this one who was beaten up. In other words, they're thinking more about their safety. He steps in, the good Samaritan, the one who, by the way, is an enemy to the Jew. He steps in and he shows love and kindness And so we are to do the same. And I would say, especially when there's nothing in return for us. That's what scripture says in Luke 14, that we are to throw a feast and in fact, we are to invite those who cannot repay us. Why? The sojourner who can do nothing for himself and can't repay you because you are displaying the gospel better than anything else. I'll never forget one time we went to do a uh, pancake breakfast. Let me explain this. On the beach in Florida during spring break, when college students go to do everything else but Christian ministry, (laughs) we show up and we invite people to a free pancake breakfast. And I told my college students at the time, hey guys, when you hand out these free tickets, these, you know, non-Christian college students, they're going to say to you, "What, what are you after? What are you trying to get? And sure enough, they go and they hand out these tickets and these costumes go, free pancake breakfast, where? It's right here. Well, it's totally free? Yeah. So I don't have to bring my wallet, leave your wallet at home. Well, do I tip somebody? No, no, it's it's free. Are you doing this for like a community service project? No, 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 no. We're just doing it because we love you, man. We want to bless you. Are you, are you getting credit for this at school? No, no, no. Are you doing this for your fraternity? I was amazed how many reasons that they could come up with why someone would do a free pancake breakfast. And once every reason was exhausted, one of those Christian, uh, non-Christian college student gals took off her sunglasses and goes, oh, you must be Christians. And I said, I was blown away. What a testimony she just gave for Jesus. And she may not even know it. What she just said basically is once every possible reason is thought of that someone would do any act of kindness for someone else for, a, for, a, for something in return. Once every reason is exhausted, the only plausible conclusion is then you must belong to the one called Christ. Because he loved not for anything in return and not because anybody deserved it. And so I'm telling you, friend, there's no better way to live out the gospel than when a refugee comes to our area. And in my closing minutes, let me just say, you as your church, in your churches, should, should seek and link up with these organizations like World Relief 
in my DFW area, there's one called For the Nations that are receiving these folks who have come in as refugees, and it's such an easy layup opportunity for us to fulfill our mission, and we're missing it. Mobilize people in your churches to say, hey, my family is here. I want to be involved. I want to engage. And then show hospitality. Invite these people, even if they're not in a refugee camp or something, even if they're not in a refugee center, if they're across the street from you, invite them in. Someone who has just moved to our area, they have a real felt need. I had a real felt need. You know what it was? The English language. And the lady said, I'm going to leverage his need there, and I'm going to pour English into him, but I'm going to use it as a bridge to give him the gospel. And I'm telling you, there's people here who say, man, I don't even know how to sign up my kid for school. I don't know how to set up a bank account. And I'm saying as Christians, we are to move, to invite them in, to show them hospitality, to help them assimilate. And when you do, you are earning, again, the right to be heard. And so I'm saying before I close in prayer, do we have a heart of compassion? I pray, as, before I pray, that we would not be like Jonah in Jonah chapter 4. You know the story. When Jonah is called to go preach the gospel to a people, the Ninevites, the Assyrians, who he already knows through the prophet Amos who's a contemporary of his, that they, these people will one day come and conquer his nation. And by the way, these were, these were terrorists of the day. They would dismember their, uh, their um, captives of war. So this was the Al-Qaeda ISIS of the day. And so he's like, no, 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 he runs away. You know the story of Jonah, and God U-turns him, obviously some big events there, and brings him back. And he preaches, literally big events, and he preaches the gospel, Right? And I think this is the biggest event, not the fish. But the Bible says he preaches very, just five Hebrew words, really. Basically calling him to repent. In 40 days you're going to be overturned. And the Bible says it reaches the king of Nineveh. He tears off his cloak. He falls on his face and, and, and puts on, um, um, uh, puts on the, the clothing of the poor and cries out sackcloth. That's the word I was looking for cries out for mercy, and God shows him mercy and does not destroy the people. And you know what happens in Jonah chapter 4? God, Jonah says, I knew this was you, that you're a gracious God, slow to anger. He quotes Exodus 34. The same qualities of God that were to his benefit, he's now ticked off when it's being given to someone else. And then God says to him, should I not pity these 120,000 people who do not know their right from their left? You have been given or the revelation. You, you have been given the knowledge of God. They don't know better. Should I not pity them? And you know what? The book of Jonah, go look it up, ends with that question mark, and you don't get a response from Jonah. You know why? Because I think that question resonates to all of us today. God says, I am a God of mercy and compassion. Should I not pity those who are cut off just as you were, who had no knowledge of me just as you didn't? And that whole picture of God bringing that plant to give Jonah shade from the sun and then removing the plant is meant to say, don't forget that I'm the one who's brought the covering over you so that you would not be destroyed. Should I not pity them? And that question goes to us today. And how will we respond? Just saying amen here? Or will we get out of our comfort zones and go across the street and knock on the door and welcome them? Would you bow your head with me and let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. God, we thank you that you are a God who is self-sufficient who has no need, and therefore when you act, it is not prompted by anything that you're trying to gain or anything that we need to do, but it's totally because you are a God of unmerited favor and grace, and you are a God of mercy to the outcast, 
And Lord, we confess we were sojourners. God, may we be a people who don't set our minds on earthly things, but remember as sojourners to love the sojourner. And I pray that there would be many more like me who would come to faith in Christ because someone like that teacher said, I'm going to get uncomfortable and go against the current and love. We love you, Jesus. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.